Welcome to no oh, that's that's now now we're broadcasting live. Are we live? We're live. All right, gentlemen. Cheers to Friday night drinks. Cheers. And What's everyone drinking? Episode first episode of Resolve Riffs. What am I drinking? Yeah, what do you drink a little rose? A New Zealand rose. Nice. I, you. I, I too will not tell you exactly the brand I'm drinking of a of a brandy because I don't want to advertise. They 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 haven't paid for any kind of advertising on our session so it's not, just not i don't mind it i got a local uh, <laughs> a local brew uh 12 star session ale from stone city kingston it's uh shameless. Shameless. how about you jason what do you I'm gonna have a west avenue cider soon but right now i have uh oakville vodka oh my god this is precisely every one of our personalities we literally <laughs> picked the alcoholic beverage that matches our personality clearly the sophisticated one clearly. <laughs> the small town uh, beer Phil drinker Tapper. butler, mm-hmm. Phil Bick, the elder statesman drinking uh, hard oak, God knows what type it's of a, alcoholic it's a, it's a cognac, hard liquor, brand, brandy cognac. I'm trying to get my nitric oxide in me, and then the CCO <laughs> drinking water, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Safety boy, yeah. Safety boy, yeah. So um, there we go. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we have we're gonna we're trying something out. We're gonna do some live sessions uh, every Friday for a little while to talk about topics du jour that uh, that seem interesting to us, and uh, try to bring some of the internal conversations we have with this crew uh, to everybody else. And um, hopefully, we'll have some future visitors that can pipe in and join the conversation either through, through uh, the chat or we might even in, in bring them in with their video. Who knows? So it's it might be uh, like it. It might go in many different directions. For those really? of you, I know. And, 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 go ahead, Mike. Oh, it just stems, the idea stems from the fact that um, through history, through hundreds of years of trading markets, generally those those trading markets took place in either cafes and then evolved to bars. And then the, the after conversations that occurred in those watering holes, once those uh, markets moved to uh, areas where they traded at, at um, whether those be in the pits in Chicago or... Um, uh, New York and what have you, uh, there was a good discussion about how one might approach the problem of investing or speculating or however you want to look at that particular um, problem. And um, I think this conversation is is a um, a way in in the in the current paradigm of having those conversations, you know, with a um, with people in remote locations while we're. So we're sitting up a bit with the uh, with liquid courage, so that we can actually say what we really feel rather than what we want to. Because we're all so shy. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> the way it was done. Mike, do me a favor, and when uh, just make sure that you're just put your mic a little bit further from your mouth, just so that the um, the there's a lot of uh, like, pa, like pa, pa. Yeah. No, that's that's yeah. Um, and for, you know, I think Mike uh, and Adam are pretty visible on Twitter and uh, a lot of the marketing that we've done. But I think Jason, you've been in one of our podcasts before, Jason Russell. Yep. Um, why don't you just give everybody here an introduction? What you where you came from quickly, and uh, and then sure. we can move on to the conversation du jour. Yep, I've been in the investment business for about 30 years uh, and uh, started in the early 90s uh, in the uh, equity derivatives group at Bankers Trust um, and uh, moved from there into the advisory business in Canada. Always very interested in alternatives, portfolio construction, uh, asset allocation, et cetera, and um, always had a very strong interest in futures. And there wasn't really much uh, uh, in the way of uh, futures uh, managers in the early 90s. Um, But uh, basically through time, through the advisory side, worked my way into starting uh, Acorn uh, Global Investments, which uh, which uh, was one of uh, the larger CTAs here in Canada for many years, and we've worked closely with you guys for a long time. And as you guys know, a few years ago, it made a whole lot of sense for us to amalgamate and get together and uh, and join the group. So that's a real quick uh, rush through uh, through history. Awesome, awesome. So, so you know a, a little bit, a thing or two about uh, Crisis Alpha tail protection and. The Crisis topic alpha, that we want to kind of chat about uh, alternatives, today. Uh, tail protection, and uh, running a business in this uh, in this wild and wacky industry of ours. So as yes, we... actually, it'd probably be cool to hear Jason's story about how his futures fund performed in two thousand eight. Like, what was that experience like for people in the trend future space? And uh, um, 
you know, how, how does that inform how people interpret or, or think that they should use trend futures in portfolios? Yeah, and I think I can compare that to what we've just experienced in the last few months as well. Uh, you know, in 2008, sort of the uh, shot across the bow first happened in September, August, really, of 2007. And uh, throughout 2008, the equity markets began to roll over and begin to lose momentum, which for a trend uh, investor is is uh, optimal. We've got time to uh, react, respond, and get positioned. And uh, by you know spring 08, we're certainly uh, quite short equities, and we're in a great position through uh, through the fall. Um, I happen to be working with a, a large number of uh, equity managers and long short equity managers and uh, hedge guys, and uh, the, the strategy performed extremely well uh, through uh, very tough times. It was very gratifying from a strategy perspective and terrifying um, from a uh, from a, a, a corporate perspective just uh, because all the other funds were uh, going through extreme pressure as was as was everybody uh, many of the other funds were focused on small cap equities and uh, and um, more uh, edgy if you will uh, uh, equity ideas so uh, in the end uh, basically I that that's what uh, caused me to kind of spin out and hang up my own, hang out my own shingle. Um, but that period, as it compares to this period, uh, where we saw strong, steady markets all of a sudden drop uh, in a matter of days and weeks. Um, very, uh, very different environment for a trend manager. It, 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 it basically shone light very clearly on what sort of um, parameter set you might be using uh, when you're looking back at trend. What is trend? You need to understand generally is uh, can be defined uh, in, a, in uh, by looking at a time period. Is it short? Is it long? Is it average of a bunch of them? Uh, in the end, everyone's got some exposure to 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 time. Um, so you saw a, lot, a large, a big disparity in results uh, from uh, extremely positive performance to devastating uh, results uh, in in the 2020. So very, very different. Um, yet the approach, like all others, has its time to shine, and uh, it's about putting all that together. And uh, you know, today we're looking at tail risk, which is kind of out on the uh, end of the spectrum. Um, and uh, is it something we should be thinking about and considering? And where does it fit in the mix? Um, well, it's certainly the 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 strategy that has gotten the most fanfare in this period, right? If you if you see true tail protection strategies in play, then you had a massive win over the last uh, couple of weeks. Well, for for a few few days, maybe maybe a week or so yeah. after. Man and now that's was a the big, star. big conversation yeah. now, right? Yeah, yeah. Man Futures was a star in 08. So, uh, and and uh, then it's run into the toughest long-term uh, challenge of of uh, in, in in a very long time. So you wonder whether anyone's going to care about tail protection eight nine years from now. Who knows? Everyone's going to pour into it for the next year. <laughs> we'll see. But it does prompt the question about what is tail protection? How does how how would should you define it? How should you define success like a successful strategy um ex post from the perspective of how well it protected against tail events there's different types of tail events that unfold over different horizons and you know just speaking of trend you've got you know uh if you simulate i, I actually i did this recently but you sort of simulate a thousand perfectly reasonable diversified long short futures trend strategies and um, over look back horizons from sort of one month out to a little over a year. And depending on how you define them or specify them, um, you know, about half of them had a really nice positive response to the tail event in 2020 and about the other half had very strong negative response. And a lot of it has to do with the type of option like profile you're, you're trying to create with the trend strategy. And, um, so there's there's lots of of grist for the mill and how to think about trend and the trend impulse um, as a proxy or uh, you know trying to imitate different types of option profiles. Um, well, well, and what that looks like about, over the short and long term. What's interesting about that work? Interesting about that work that you did 
is that you can also look at a wide variety of public CTAs, look at their how how well they did over the last two months and see that same type of dispersion. But the the topic of tail protection in the way that I think people imagine it, which is this uh, long term, um, you know, put protection that's going to be there, that's going to cost you money, almost like an insurance premium. And then when you need it the most is going to be there to really offset losses and more than anything ends up being the S&P, right? Because that's where you have the most liquidity. The problem with analyzing how well tail protection strategies did, so I'm not talking about CTAs here, I'm talking about the idea of these tail, these, these option-based tail protection strategies, is, is that a handful of them have shown public results, but it's very tough to discern who, who won here, who did well, who blew up, who didn't get the right parameters right. And, um, and, and even if you want to model it up, doing it with options ends up being very, very difficult. Right. So it, it's kind of it continues to be kind of this obscure strategy where everybody that I talk to likes the idea of it, but very few people like to pull the trigger on it because it happens to be offered by, let's say, one manager with a unique set of parameters, but they don't necessarily trust those parameter sets. So they need to aggregate a bunch of these to even feel comfortable. And it's not as systematic as the, the type of people that we talk to like to be. And so it just it's a, it's a tough strategy to really wrap your mind around um, and behaviorally to stick to. I mean, you really were at the forefront of trying to get private clients to stick mm -hmm. with a strategic allocation to these types of funds. Um, you know, around two thousand and eight and after. So yep. actually, that story is really interesting. You should share it. Yeah, well, we, I was always, everybody I think that has listened to our podcast before knows that I had a pretty formative, a, an interesting formative experience in, in Peru and, you know, hyperinflation blow up, money lost by the family and so on, um, that led to a constant paranoia of these tail events. And so positioning for myself and my clients into 2008 was very much into CTAs and tail protection strategies like those. Um, as I built up a bigger book, I sourced and found a legitimate like permanent tail protection strategy and it was one of these where you add a one or two percent of your clients portfolios in these strategies they're going to try to to put together an options strategy that is going to be as long lasting as possible but inevitably that one or two percent would need to fade out into into nothing it was it was a unitized product right so it wasn't buying directly it wasn't separately managed accounts this is across a a private wealth book so that fund unit that you bought for clients would eventually go to zero. And then you'd have to Well, you'd buy a series, right? Yeah. You'd, buy a you'd buy a series, series in a fund. And, and then over when it's about to go to zero, period, it would decay yeah. to zero. And then you'd have to re up. Re -up. Yeah. Right. So I did, we did that for a few years. Right. And how uh, did clients react to that? Well, they, it was just at first, everybody bought in. It makes total sense in the long term, right? If you compare this with your long positions, yes, it'll hurt, but not if you actually look at it as a unit. But the problem is that nobody looks at it as a unit, right? And so it became untenable. It became an impossible thing to hold for clients without constantly having to be on the phone and reiterating the value of it. And sadly, it was, um, you know, it just never saw the light of day. It never got the opportunity to shine, even though the, the narrative was it'll take 10 years before we see this work, but when it works, it'll be there for you. Right. Mike, it's, notwithstanding it's, the, the economic arguments for or against a strategy like this, why is it so difficult for clients to, to stick with this for the, for the long term? And I mean, we've had a couple of interesting blowups recently with CalPERS pulled their allocation to this type of tail head strategy just in advance of the recent crisis. Um, one of the pension plans in Alberta, same thing. So it's not just retail investors that struggle with committing to a long-term allocation here. What are the big bugaboos behaviorally that make this so difficult to stick with? Well, I, I, I think that's, that's um, the confirmation of your peer group is a huge part of this. If, as, as um, Jason, you alluded to, if people do pile into um tail hedge protection strategies, it legitimizes the fact that that you're there with a company. And this is the this is indicative, I think, of a, of a complex dynamic system, which, you know, we come back to theoretically why, um, if the efficient market hypothesis were to actually be true, soup to nuts from zero to 100, 
then there is no need for any tail hedge protection strategy. And so if we accept that markets are, this is a feature, not a bug, markets are efficient through some periods of time, and then they go through periods of time of, um, you know, sort of these uh, rapid adjustments. Okay, so then how should we how should we deal with those rapid adjustments? And um, theoretically, if we if we say okay, we we agree um, that it's a it's a feature, not a bug. Um, these rapid price changes will occur, and we have to have something in the strat in, in our suite of strategies that deals with that. The next question is how many of our peers accept that as truth and are willing to uh, willing to engage in that. And so behaviorally, you can go through a period of time of uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years, as long as the collective memory of the market uh, fades to a point of forgetting. And um, then only the few that were able to have the rigor to withstand the performance drag are the ones who can stick to the process of, of buying the insurance. And so there's there's a couple of feedback loops there that are really, really tough, right? So you're a particular manager, whether it's for a retail client or for an institutional client, um, and um, your strategy has been a drag on their overall performance and their job depends on that performance. And that that drag can be a decade long. And there it was, also in, the, it was also in the face of uh, the popularity of being shortfall for the last three years, right? Yeah. Immense yeah, pressure on the institutional side to take up the short ball trade. Immense pressure even on the um, on the retail side. So not only are you saying, hey, no, that's a bad idea. I don't want to get that juicy return from a behavioral perspective. You're also saying, and, and you'd be better off losing a little bit instead. Right? Precisely. And if your friends aren't losing, if, you're, if your peer group is not engaging in that same trade, then... Um, De facto, you look dumb or you underperform. However, you want to. However, you want to talk about that particular instance of underperformance. That's yeah, how you are perceived. It's fraught with behavioral uh, challenges, and and uh, among them also just the complexity of of executing on something like this. Uh, you know, um, we've all been observing these ideas for a while, and you know, it started out with puts. Um, you know, you can uh, Delta Hedge or Gamma Scalp, however you want to call it, vol products like VIX and Variance Futures, um, dedicated short sellers, credit default swaps. All of these things have varying uh, elements of, of liquidity. And you don't know, there's no real consensus as to, yep, this is the way to do it. And we're all trying to find what's the most, the least expensive way, which typically is also the least liquid uh, way. And then the other wild card is, you know, we're all looking at things like the S&P 500. And when it bounces back like it has in the last few weeks, people think, well, what do I need tail protection for? How would I have timed, timed the exit? So this is why of, I, uh, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is why I love to, to um, map this to an insurance metaphor, right? Where totally. you, yes. you sort of have, imagine you live on an island and the island has on average through the centuries gotten a hurricane once every 20 years. And you decide that you're going to buy a home there and you're going to buy hurricane insurance and you pay whatever it is, uh, 12, a thousand bucks a month. So 12,000 bucks a year on hurricane insurance. And there's no hurricanes for five years. And, you know, but you continue to renew your policy, you pay the hurricane insurance, you know, another five years goes by, there's a hurricane, right? You've given up twelve thousand a year in after-tax income, while your neighbors are out using that for an extra vacation. They put in an addition on the house. They've got a nicer car. You've paid all this insurance, and so, you know, you how long do you continue to pay this insurance while your neighbors are reaping the benefits of the excess cash flow? And there's only like it takes a really yeah. safety-oriented or long-term oriented person to continue to pay that cost in the face of the that month to month and day to day realized disadvantage that's right in your face you've got a smaller house you've got right. you know fewer vacations and you got a less fancy car the and you look stupid for loses. decades 
Yeah, and, and yeah. the reality is, are, are we are, is is, uh, is our our cost just been our taxes? Because <laughs> the taxes are paying off in a lot of cases right now for 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 the risks that the responsible but, would pay. So two things two things come to mind on that. Just before you jump in, Rod, two things come to yeah. mind on that. One is the um, thinking about it as insurance and and looking at Wimbledon and how Wimbledon has paid for something like ten or fifteen years of insurance. Mm-hmm. for the potential for a COVID issue and actually is collecting a massive um, uh, benefit from that because they were able to just cancel Wimbledon and they received their their payment. Um, but they forewent, I think it was $2 million a year was their premium for, it's it's maybe seven or 17. Uh, memory, there's a seven in there somewhere. Um, so kudos to them for for paying for that insurance and incorporating that into the profit margin of the business and thinking about that as a legitimate outcome. Maybe maybe uh, Bill Gates is on their board or something. Um, the other thing that's so interesting about this, as you describe it, Adam, it, you know, the hurricane on an island, and uh, some some islands have mandated that you must pay for insurance. So now we have mm. the hockey the hockey helmet issue. I don't right. remember the behavioral. I do, um, and I love this. Study. Really good right. analogy. Yeah. So, so if you ask hockey players, "Hey, helmets help you; they protect you," um, and the visors and whatnot, hockey helmets, hockey players will say, "No, it's a competitive disadvantage." When I'm on the ice, I have a disadvantage. So, unless you legislate the helmet and the visor to equalize the playing field for safety of all, then you will have these uh, uneven competitions where people choose to just forego to have those extra vacations that you talked about to have that extra lifestyle or whatever the case may be to win some short-term mandates in the institutional framework. Um, and, and so on islands like Grand Cayman, it's not, a, it's not an option. You must pay for your uh, hurricane insurance. It is law. Thus all players, you know, to make the, bring the analogy full, full, uh, full circle, all players must wear visors and helmets and, and everybody must figure out how to play competitively within that framework. So let's, let's take, let's extend that metaphor, Mike, how could you create policy, for example, you know, introduce it to ERISA policy or pension policy, you know, how could you, what sort of policies could you enforce or introduce to mandate some kind of risk management and force everybody to, to have to take, you know, some kind of pay some kind of cost for this type of insurance in the asset management field? Wow. Is so, it worth it? Is there the problem is I, I, I actually I'll give an I example. that's the question. So, I, so look, I, look, I think it, you can. I'll give an example. I, I, like you could, yeah. for example, legislate that there's a there's a, a penalty or you violate regulations if you take greater than um a twenty percent shortfall on your pension um assets in a single month or something like that. I mean, obviously. I just threw it out there. So this yeah. obviously requires more thought than, than just this, but that type of policy and enforcement would force people to think about what the best way to pay for and, pro- and you know, probability weight that, that type of outcome. Certainly you'd, you'd pray, you'd probably place limits on leverage too, right? Because um, even, even when you allow, you know, this, this infinite leverage in portfolios that the market becomes more efficient, be- but it becomes less stable. So if you if you think about it from a market a full market I think you'd have to approach it from a full market perspective so there's an over an overarching body that decides what what sort of the guidelines and, and limits are on all of these things in order to ensure that the system itself can can operate and um, I think we've talked over Rod you you have a couple points so I no, I just I, think I, that I, it's it's a, the, the whole idea of insurance can you guys hear me okay. Yep. Yeah, the whole idea of insurance um, is a good analogy because you're saying you're paying a little bit in order to get something else, right? But the truth is, depending on when this whole tail protection thing started, it was this idea of buying a put option, right? 10% out of the money, 20% out of the money. Like that has a real cost. It's not the same as an insurance. When I pay my, my life insurance or my home insurance, it is a, a tiny fraction of the cost of my, of my income, what I receive from, from working uh, from, you know, working stiff. When you look at the cost of, of varying types of tail protection, they can account for as much as 12% of your annualized rate of return. I think one of the first things that we did back in the day showed that a naive put option strategy costs that much yearly. 
And so what's what's difficult about it is that the ones that really do work, the ones that are permanently there, because the, the whole idea of tail protection is that you have to be there, right? You can't predict it's going to happen. And if you're not there, you're not getting paid, right? Well, those ones are really expensive. So you have to get fancy and, and try to finance them using straddles and, and strangles and stuff like that. But the others, that, the, the other thing, so th that didn't sell. Okay. That didn't sell. For the longest time, it didn't sell, right? Because it, there wasn't that analogy of insurance didn't play because it was way more expensive than insurance. So then you get into, okay, maybe we don't do that permanent thing. Maybe we play more of the dynamic ball game. And, and, and this is where the narrative has shifted, shifted to for tail protection strategy, where in that first week of uh, February, March, they didn't pay, right? Because they weren't positioned to pay. And only after the, the weeks, the couple of weeks after when they finally positioned themselves in to really benefit from a, from a big tail protection push, that they, that they actually pay out. But there's no way to, to have an insurance, a small insurance premium without taking some directionality so even the, the the successful the ones that have lasted this long for the last five ten years have had to take directional bets and have not really had a full-on tail protection strategy in place and so this is where it becomes complicated to choose a tail protection manager right which one is going to which one has the right speed by which they're going to get into the trade and also ones that aren't going to cost me a lot of money for for you know the, the, while i wait to get paid well, there's also the, you know, just to proceed with the insurance analogy, there's also um, the deductible, right? So so you can imagine the right. further out of the money um, that, your, that your protection kicks in, then the cheaper it is to buy, but then the larger the loss you need to take before you get any insurance payout. And so you've got all these nonlinearities, for example, um, Imagine the recent sell-off had only caused the market to drop by 19.9%. And you had all these 20% out of the money uh, put buyers. Well, those 20% out of the money put buyers, well, those 20% of the money puts are a little cheaper than the 10% out of the money puts, right? They're more expensive than the 30% out of the money puts. Um, so you, you've paid a lower premium over the years, but also you needed a greater than 20% loss in order for that to kick in. What if it was a, a greater than 25% or greater than 30%? Now you've got way more gamma the further out of the money you go. So the more of a hero you look like if you happen to own puts that were further out of the money, but the probability that the market actually drops that far in a, in a period of time that triggers that payoff is unmeasurably small, right? So there's all these nonlinearities combined with the fact your N can be counted on, you know, only a few fingers on one hand so that it all ends up being completely random and just completely random luck. How far did the market fall over what time horizon? That's going to dictate that a few guys who happen to be positioned for that exact type of environment won the lottery. Everybody else that was hedging different types of tails look like morons and you know, 99.9% .9 of investors can't differentiate between luck and skill. Well, I, I think your last comment is bang on. Like the, the ability to differentiate is really, really tough. I think it, I think it, some of this stems from the, the point of, well, how, how do you want to, how do you want to hedge um, the potential, th that potential left tail, right? So there, there, there are a couple of ways to do that. One is uh, adaptability. Uh, one is building and resilience in the portfolio. So resilience could be, be built in with uh, the diversity of asset classes, um, the way you access the beta from the various asset classes. So do you incorporate all asset classes? Do you use factors in those asset classes? When you build those asset classes, do you use something like more defensive stocks in order to source that beta? Um, and then ad adaptability, how how much would you adapt to the various circumstances in the, in the shorter term? What What's the quickness that you would respond to that? So, so it just goes beyond just a uh, a, a put type strategy and a, and a tail hedge protection. And so, th so I just want to add that color to 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 that discussion because I, I know you guys are talking more specifically. You know, it's a about really important point, Mike, and it it points out I it, what, something that we we sort of threw out in the beginning but never asked you to find. Like, what is tail? What is mm -hmm. what yeah. tail are we protecting? Right. Yeah. No. A, that's a that's a, a weekly, very important point. Is it daily tail. Is it weekly Correct. frequency tail? Is it yeah. is it monthly? Is it quarterly? 
And depending on the type of tail you want to protect, you need often need a completely you different. Have, you have a different answer. You, you have yeah. a different answer. Yeah, the yeah, question creates yeah. a different answer. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can argue certainly five, 10, 15 percent, 25 percent is not a tail at all. But yeah, it's just it's, well, it's a feature. And it's a feature you're right. Mark. Attitude so, also is, so, is how you need yeah. to find tail. You know, do, do we manage that with diversification? And at what point do we yeah. begin to include a tail? And and that again, it gets hard. Um, and that is yeah. the big, that is the important point there. Well, it, this there's, becomes there's behavioral, there's behavioral option, now. Right? Right? There's it another behavioral. Option, right? The influence of what your peers are doing based on what they're perceiving as what a tail is, which I think is probably a, a non-stationary, a changing perception um, in the marketplace. So I was having a yeah, You're only a winner or a loser relative to your peer group, right? It doesn't, mm -hmm. nobody in the asset management or very, very few people in the asset management business actually care about absolute results, right? It's how mm -hmm. did, how did my pension fund do relative to my peer pensions? How did my endowment do relative to my, to the other endowments that I mark against? How did my clients portfolios perform relative to uh, the people that my clients are going to be speaking with at their next cocktail party. These oh, yeah. are the only things that matter. The absolute results take a far back seat yeah. until you get into periods like 2008 or, or 2000, 2003, where you actually have a middle class that is genuinely hurting and unable to make ends meet and people are losing jobs. And that's when the, the absolute level of wealth losses begin to kick in. But you know, 95% of the time it's a relative game. And the only thing that matters is relative status. And that's the behavioral aspect that is just. It makes it really, really difficult, right? It, it, this is why, I mean, what Jason said was key is how much do you want to be different here? Right. Cause even there's been a bunch of S and P plus tail attempts over the years. Right. And what they're coming out with now is like, look, this S and P plus tail outperformed S and P. Yeah, but from point A to point B, it did. But <laughs> there were many years where that tail protection strategy not didn't underperform by one or two, but it took away five percentage points in a single year, right? Yep. The, the, it's just, it's not, it, it, there's no alignment. N they don't have the alignment that people think they're getting. They think they're getting, it's going to cost you 1% a year, but sometimes it's going to cost you five, sometimes you're going to get three, so that one makes it even more difficult to really stick to. And uh, and so you, you got a question, why hasn't there been a massive uptake in these tail protection strategies plus a portfolio? And it's because maybe, just maybe better diversification does the job, right? Maybe the diversification, that, that uh, por better portfolio construction does a better job from point A to point B, maybe. And no, or maybe you've got to take the risk in markets in order to earn the returns. Well, I think both of those are true. <laughs> you do. Um, they are true uh, until you get a liquidity crisis. A liquidity crisis then creates all kinds of issues for everybody. We saw that in, um, you know, so whatever it was mid mid March, where even the things that should be responding well to the the shock were being sold off. I mean, it was a liquidity issue. Uh, potentially call that a solvency issue versus a credit issue. And and so you need the the lender of last resort to step in. Um, you know, now, now we get into an area of um, the central bank has to be the, the lender of last resort, but they have to pretend that they're not and they have to hold it out to the, to the world that they won't be till they have to be, but they're not right. It's, <laughs> it's a game of chicken. We're not. Um, but of course we will be because the system can't collapse upon itself, but we're not. But we are, but we're not. <laughs> so as a, as a, as a uh, asset manager, what do we like, you know, <laughs> I wonder about including a strategy like this, like a true tail, is that uh, better left in the hands of the client to decide? So you parse this off separately or should asset managers be looking to include tail strategies in their portfolios? Um, it's a really a, good, question. There's, a good question. there's two, there's two dimensions to that answer that, that I've given quite a bit of thought to, right? One of them is behavioral. So, you know, if you don't have a line item on your uh, investment statement that shows that this instrument has gone down for 80 months in a row and you had to continue to re-up and, you know, you, like eventually investors just get sick of looking at a losing investment over and over again, month after month. 
Um, and that's the quality of a lot of pure tail hedges is that they tend to just be constant money losers that you kind of actually, most people kind of hope they don't even end up paying off, right? You hope that you never have to go through a crisis period. You're just going to continue to pay you this, this premium. It's like paying high, life insurance. You don't want to die. The, theoretically, it's, it's that's Wimbledon. how they Wimbledon should never yeah, wanted to right. have yeah. the COVID pay off. That's not that, right. And if you approach yeah. it like that, I think that's a key to having the the framing around the mental allocation that you can withstand the drag. It helps. That's, it helps that's for sure. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, demonstrably it's not sufficient, right? Because most clients yes. cannot, with, even mass, with, with, with good framing, they cannot stick with it. So, so behaviorally, it's better to have it inside another investment where you can sort of cloak or mask the constant decay. Here. Just like it, it, yeah. cloaking there. That's right. Fine, it's fine like a, it's a cloak of invisibility um, <laughs> on, <laughs> on, on the, uh -huh. mm -hmm. the losses that investors just don't see. Like it's opaque to them, right? So there's from the behavioral standpoint, I think it makes a big difference. Also, from a financial st standpoint, I think it makes a really big difference because if you build a tailhead strategy as a constant capital size sleeve, alongside a broader suite of strategies, then what you can do is actually gamma scalp, like you said. So, you know, you've got, you've got this sort of um, constant allocation. You're, you're maybe short um, the, the, so you're selling insurance some of the time, you're harvesting those premiums some of the time. Um, you've got the opportunity to flip long, but as you take losses on that, you refund it out of the gains from all of the other strategies in the portfolio. And, and when you have a payoff from your insurance bet, that payoff immediately goes back into the other fund so that you're keeping a constant capital exposure to that strategy. And therefore, you're actually able to, to implement a gamma scalping um, uh, overlay. Don't give away the magic, but diverse Easy. basket of Easy. strategies, which is obviously how we've chosen. Hey, to what, and one of the we biggest, did, we didn't do the, that. I mean, maybe we did, but we probably every didn't. time, so every time did. I speak with, yeah, <laughs> so one, told, of the, <laughs> one of the biggest issues is definitely the, the, uh, because it's, you're dealing with such obscure products, right? When you're trying to find this from a third party manager, when you're, when you when you want that tail protection, you not only want that payoff, but you also want to be able to capture that payoff, right? At the time that you want to capture it. And, and there is an issue with with a lot of these sale protection strategies that are monthly liquidity, right? Where you might you might Very have said, point. okay, I need this totally. now. But like, sorry, we can't do that. You're gonna have to wait 15 days. It's just the whole nature of it is is complicated. Even even when you have you find good managers, it's tough to get what you need when you want it to. And so that your point of putting that product together in one makes a lot of sense because they're suppose i imagine going to do it for you they can do it internally even at that point having a monthly liquidity is not a problem um but if you're just having that pure tail protection as a separate standalone it could be complicated right it could it could you're so right it, but what's the flip side never get the flip off. side of that is that now you've got a, a, a multi strat strategy that's got a sleeve of the portfolio that may be sucking returns for you know a decade at a time which goes to my point so, of like not only sucking returns, but you might have a year where it took away 10%. Maybe over the full 10 year period, it's net neutral. But for that one year, it took away 10% returns. And then when you have to explain why. Yep. Tracking error is huge. You're done. Right? Yep. It is. It's a, it's a big no, issue. I, I would add the behavioral side of that is if you're selling to a group where you're suggesting that you're going to take their job is is another challenge in that particular issue right if so point, so now into that in more detail I love now that. now you're now you're saying to a whatever a sophisticated institutional uh, endowment board that you're going to do that and they have several people whose job is specifically to allocate to different strategies and structures and reallocate to them at opportune times to your point rod which doesn't quite allow them to take advantage of that because it's a month end type thing rather than a moment type issue. And I think this is really important because the discipline that that can bring has tremendous value. If you think about, if you think about, um, except this is my premise that financial crisis are sort of like uh, earthquakes. They're very hard to predict when they occur. Their occurrence is a prelude to other occurrences. Okay. But, also, 
if the occurrence happens and more time passes, it's less and less likely that you get another occurrence. So for an earthquake, as an example, you have a major tectonic event. The chances of having another event the next day are very high. They're like 50%. But 10 days later, they drop to 10%. So to your point, if you think about that doesn't, ha it's not exactly how they work in financial markets, but take that timeline and walk it forward in a, a financial event happens. There's a crisis moment. There's an opportunity to own longer term positive risk premium assets, which may recover by month end. And you only have this monthly fractal from which you can view that particular opportunity. And so there's, there's, there's lots there that just prevents the market from acting. As yeah. You live really on a hurricane um, not a hurricane belt. What is it? You live on a fault line. Yeah. But you can only evacuate your home once a month. Right. <laughs> Precisely. That's the analog, right? So if it happens intramonth, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. And this is the other thing. I think the, the that, that fault line reference is you only know whose house was built up to specs, like earthquake specs, after the earthquake, when you look around the neighborhood and you see five houses on the ground and the two houses that are standing, then you know. And yeah. this is the challenge with allocators and investors and um, those char financial inter intermediaries that are charged with allocating assets, that they're going to forgo returns in the short term. They're going to have less returns over a 10-year period, but they're going to say, listen, your house is earthquake proof. And the person is going to say, but we haven't had an earthquake. Then and the by earthquake the way, happens. this is linked to the, to the four-year moving average of your average right. alpha. Correct. So if you don't have a, an event in that four years, then you're foregoing compensation. Mm -hmm. so there's a massive misalignment of incentives. It, and it, it's, it, it comes back to one of our core values that we want to be, you know, we, we, we would like to have, have some sort of connection between the realized risk-adjusted returns for our clients. Like that, that, you know, and so we want to think about making sure that you're there for the returns as they occur. And I think there's where an, there's another gap or a, a, a convergence of, of how that kind of manifests in portfolios in real time. So, I mean, the debate is really, um, I, I look, let's look at the AQR and it seemed to love debate that's the raging right now, right? Let's, re, let's put aside the pettiness of, of the actual Twitter discussion. Um, but it is, one is arguing for the amazingness of tail protection. The other side is saying it's good, but by the way, diversification is really solid and it may possibly be better versus a naive approach. So, you know, it, it, which one, which one of those two approaches is, uh, is, is one better than the other? Is there a right or wrong or is it all personality based, right? Well, one is of them at least that, you can kind of sort of wrap your arms around, right? I mean, we all need to acknowledge that that we've got, even if we've got 40 years of data, maybe that only that only really captures a handful of different regimes. So maybe 40 years is really an N of five in terms of market state. I'm just throwing numbers around, but, sure. but at least you've kind of got, you know, it's probably not five, it's probably, I don't know, there's, there's 10 or 15 or something, right? The thing about tail events, like all these tail managers that with the thousand percent return plus in March, these guys, like there were there were other mechanisms to deliver better average returns and better average results and better average diversification for portfolios, um, even during other tail periods unless you go all the way back to 1987, like literally 2000, 2003, um, 90 to 91, um, the long-term capital management, Thai bought Asian crisis, Russian default in, in 98. All of those things were very well managed through some combination of diversification or trend or other types of strategies that have long-term positive expectancy really the only strategies, or sorry, the only periods that were not well managed by those other um, types of approaches was October 1987 and the recent crisis. 
And keep in mind, the recent crisis played out twice as fast. Yeah, as it's velocity. Like, so velocity, you know, yes, yeah, speed t- is t- an issue. T- tail ahead. events here, I think the exactly. velocity is really, really key. And that's something that's similar in 87 and similar in uh, in, in just just uh, in the last couple of months. Um, if, if the same uh, depth was reached over even just double the number of days, I think you'd see a dramatically lower um, uh, a bump here. And back to the no, original Jason, question. it would completely yeah. reorder the it would completely reorder oh, yeah. the winners. The yeah. guys that won this time yep. would would have looked like morons, and and a whole other group of people would have looked like heroes. Yeah. And it would who's would have been purely look, due to randomness. But that's yep. well, who's saying that it's a CTA or or a tail protection strategy? I, I honestly think that there is. I think you need to have a certain type of personality, right? Because you you need to you Adam need to wrap your mind around that stuff. You need to have all these data points. You need to. I don't. I I I I understand tail. I understand the benefit of having a lot of convexity, positive convexity, when I need it in a way that CTAs that were midterm to long term just didn't have, and and we all knew wouldn't have in a big correction like this. They would eventually adjust, right? And so there is. I, I honestly think that there is a place for this for a lot of people portfolio. Just not everybody's portfolio, and I'm they one of the guys that, yeah. that likes that likes to have that near certainty. Although there's, we can have a discussion about what tail we're we're trying to protect against, right? We're talking about the S and P here, but there's a lot of tails that we need to think about as well, right? Could be bond uh, tail tail risk and all that stuff. But from the perspective of, is it valuable? It's insanely valuable for certain people that can. But take how do you how do you even create hit. a strategy? You can. You can absolutely create a tail head strategy that protects a, against a very specific type of tail. You can even have a, a a basket, an ensemble of tail head strategies, but the ensemble will still only protect against a certain shape of tail, a certain magnitude of loss in a specific market or group of markets over what? a very specific time horizon. Why do you say that? It's just a shape. Yeah, I think that's well, a great well, point. Again, you can't oh, hedge against about... every risk. Okay, okay. Hedging so against maybe... every risk, like demonstrably, delivers no returns over the long term. Well, it probably has, has no, a significant I... cost, actually. I see. I see. So I, I was thinking about the S and P five hundred collapsing. You create an ensemble of managers that actually that will have different parameters and will respond faster, slower, have different deal with the different con- convexities and and provide value on average for that particular S&P 500 event, right? Which, you know, I think has merit that the but whole idea of the equity market. what you're missing is that there's a shape to that, whatever the hedge ensemble you've created has its own shape. Has its own that shape. That is an right. optimal event <laughs> that will work for that specific hedge portfolio. And if it's not that specific shape of event, then you'll have paid a lot of premium for it applies to absolutely not everything getting the that you do for the rest of your portfolio, right? Doesn't, so, it doesn't so this is where craftsmanship, except that this, most this is, of them have positive expectancy, whereas tail hedge definitionally, the closer you get to shorter term hedge, the, the closer you get to approximating a, a long put strategy, the closer you get to negative expectancy. Short term trend, like ultra short term trend, demonstrably has negative expectancy. But it, it killed it. It did killed great it in, March. in March after like, <laughs> you know, 10 so years of can negative I, return. Can I offer, but, can but, I offer but, that this is the crap? Can I just defend the last? That, it is crap. Well, I think I want, I want to, I want to set yeah. you up. I want yeah. to set you up. All right. This is the craftsmanship that, that also understands social influence of what is the market of choice today in the current zeitgeist. And, and that social influence is that, what what are portfolio managers most concerned about? And I'll just I'll turn it over to you, Rod, and you can take it from there. For, okay, so so the the social aspect is whether you can withstand being different from your from your neighbors, right? I think I had this conversation with uh, Chris Schindler uh, over drinks uh, from uh, ex teachers. I think we had him on the podcast. We did have him on the podcast. And our conclusions were the same. If you want to use tail protection strategies that are that you can count on. You're going to have to take a return hit, right? But you won't suffer f- 
from those big gaps that you see when equity markets collapse. And, and the thing about equity markets collapsing that are, that's unique is that it tends to coincide with economic markets collapsing. It tends to coincide with liquidity across everything drying up. So it's a good proxy to want to tail hedge against, right? As we were facing the abyss during this particular period, there were nights where we were like, oh my God, shit, is tomorrow going to, are we going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be 30% down? At which well, it was, point, it was the market closures too, the potential. Yeah, for and it was it was like the only thing that will protect if everything, if it's a liquidity event, doesn't matter whether you own bonds or gold or stocks, if it's a liquidity event, the only thing that's going to be there are these preset tail protection type strategies. Really, right? so your put strategy on the S and P and ES futures are closed over option expiration. What's your payoff? Yep. Okay. Fair point. Hold, well. That is a very specific type of event. I'm it's, talking about the most likelihood, which we've seen over and over again in these types so of events. So now we're talking about period. probabilities? We're no, talking we're, about we're, the probabilities of tail events. Well, we're talking no, about the craftsmanship of social there. influence and what people care about. But you have to, <laughs> you, I think you have to take all of all of these issues it into consideration. Yes. Yeah. That's a very no, you're not the worst possible I outcome. I don't think either one of you are wrong. You're at, and you actually don't pay off. Correct. There's a think you're wrong. I think beyond, you're, beyond you're tail risk, right. there we <laughs> beyond tail risk, we've all heard this before. Well, well, if that goes, we're all screwed. So there's there's a there's a point where things bend and they break. And we, arguments, you mean? Arguments, specific yeah, arguments. arguments. <laughs> and, and everything. So when something <laughs> breaks, then it's like ah, eh, can't hedge against that anyways. And you can argue tails up close to that. And look, look at what happened to the crude, to futures markets um, in, in the last few in weeks, oil. going yeah. negative um, in, in crude. And um, I recall from 2008, the uh, counterparties blowing up all over the place, like massive high quality counterparties, the rating agencies, AAA meant nothing. So there's a whole bunch of that risk that gets introduced at Very a time point. when you're expecting the tail to pay off. So I think understanding where the tail is is important and where is that other point beyond tail where we're all screwed anyways happens um well and, and I, I think i would, it, I, would, a, I, would I, I don't know the answer it's a well i would posit that's where central banks come in to be the lender of last resort and the provide the liquidity they're in and, way and before this, that this uh, this is this is really an interesting question because yep. they are timing their influence um in order that they're not perceived to have been there but their job is is to prevent total financial collapse. It's kind of in their mandate to be that lender of last resort, um, and I think that's what they learned in the in the twenty nine episode, letting you know bank um, depositors and banks go bankrupt, and and those bank depositors weren't really risk takers, and so that they've been emboldened obviously by the process of long term capital management or well 1987 leading into long term capital management leading into the 2008 crisis leading into the current crisis i think they've been emboldened more and more to take earlier and more extreme action and that's just a function of of the market getting getting used to that um whether that's right or wrong i don't, I don't know um but i th i think oh no the next time we look at crisis in the teeth markets are going to rally massively on, in anticipation of a <laughs> overreaction <laughs> And this, 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 this is the vault. This is the new tail. Is that the new tail is happening, happening now? Oh my God. No. Yeah. yeah, that's possibly. happening now. Possibly. Yeah. It's it, possibly. possibly. Sure. I, Agreed. I actually Agreed. think that, that look, you're talking to a particular personality that has seen massive blow ups in his personal life. That I, I just, you, you, I will always be willing to give up the upside any given year to make sure that if. The market doesn't just drop 20 in a single day, but drops 80 because that's who I am. I want something to be there that has the possibility of paying out that nothing else can be. If it's a, I think it'll a be lot a of clients would agree with you. But what we've what we've observed is that people agree in theory as the conversation occurs in the beginning. And as months go by and you get months after months after months of losses, that argument People feel that they hate this line item. They feel it, and therefore they're looking for any excuse to sell it. And you know, you're, you end up fighting an uphill battle. I, think, I don't think I don't think I and, and you guys, because you guys were part of it for a bit. I don't think you and I did a good enough job 
at at educating. And I think a lot of a lot of what we've done with our uh, our followers, our client base, with the books is we've educated them to do better and care less about the S and P. I mean, nobody that deals with us that has been successful cares about what the S and P does in any given day. We did that through education. And I just don't think you've had enough of an, or uh, I think you need to make more of an effort in order, if you're going to do a tail protection strategy, to make sure that the clients that you're attracting stick to it by making sure that we're, we're constantly pounding the table on the reasons that you signed up for it and understanding also the downsides, right? Understanding that you will not have a better return necessarily over long periods of time as you would if you didn't have the tail protection in place. So, yes, I mean, well, this, this is this is the challenge, Rod. This is totally 100 percent the trade off. So you go through 10 years and you have your 10 year track record that underperforms your peer group by one and a half to two percent based on your tail protection strategy. And and the next gap in, in the performance reporting is not 11 years, it's 15. And so the last crisis happened 15 years ago where you can show the payoff. Um, but if it didn't, if it happened between year 10 and 15, there is no indication that you have any expertise in this field. So, so it becomes, it, I, I do agree that is an educational thing. And, and the whole concept of tail protection comes back to a, you have to go back to first principles and think about it from a theoretical perspective so that you can come to an, a, conclu a conclusion of belief. And that conclusion of belief has to be higher than, um, than the potential, um, reality checks along the way, <laughs> which are going to question your ability to stick with the freaking the, the program. And this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it's really tough. It's, um, it's, and it's, it's a lot gonna of be a lot of people willing. And there's going to be a lot of converts, right? There's going to oh. be a lot of people. You're going to get a list. Everybody, everybody, everybody talked into trend everybody, strategies in 2009. I, totally agree. I agree. I agree. Where is, where is it, the man AHL fund it, here in Canada now? <laughs> the question is, oh, you know, you didn't. That that served me really well in 08, by the by, just because you bought it after. No, it's you, it's and, you and the about, other four people that about were in it, Rod. Like you right. and those four guys did great. Exactly. <laughs> it's the same thing for the strategy <laughs> but, but, with the tail protection fund. But You're going to look really smart once every 10 or 12 years. Unfortunately, when the tail hits, you've got no assets because you've underperformed your benchmark by 2.5% a year for 10 years. So this provides an opportunity. Look, the, the world has changed a ton over the last 10 years, right? And there is a lot. Look, look at what we're doing right now, right? We're evolving. We've 10 gone days, arguably. From, from written <laughs> pod, podcast to books to audio, now video, right? We're going to invite people in. There's people are, are empowered to learn more. So I have to. I have a tendency to look at, at the bright side, to see that there is actually better than what we've seen in the past from clients, from investors, from just human beings generally. We're better educated than we've ever been before. Everybody's jumping on the tail protection bandwagon right now. And our, a lot of the net rhetoric is, yeah, but nobody will stick to it, right? We started with this conversation um, in the beginning of this podcast. I believe that we're, we're better equipped now than ever to, though for those who jumped in the bandwagon to keep as many of those people in the bandwagon long term. If indeed it suits them for their their long term benefits, that's what I, I strongly believe. Just just to be understanding of a complex adaptive system, the more people that jump on this, the less, less effective likely. it's going to be. The more cost it's because gonna be. it'll be a different. Well, it, 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 it cost can actually shrink, but the less effective it would actually be because there is there is a whole bunch of buying at some point in the market to cover off those pseudo shorts that happen. So corrections become, it's a self oh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to buy tail protection until 10 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's beyond tail. I think just thinking about like just risk management period has a big cost, even just asset allocation, forget tail at all. Very and good it, point. Right. So even with a 15 or a 12% drawdown, anyone who's trying to manage risk by allocating to bonds saved investors in the heart in the teeth of this they saved them some real money and lost them that in in the recovery the sometimes mm -hmm. but that's all looked at in a short term lens and a lot of people obviously uh, with recency bias that's where they live looking at the last 3 months or and in this case 3 months can make a one year number uh, look dramatically different. So there's years. this, in yeah, the there's, there's the, uh, the real tail, your tail hedge guys. 
like a lot of tactical managers right now are underperforming the S and P over the last month. Actually, this is a really good point because so what does it take for a tactical right? manager? I, I actually think it's not the worst idea to be underperforming right now, guys. Like if there's another leg down, which there may very well be, you're in a much better place now. Hey, the first immediate snap hurt. That's not a typical depth tail event. That was a velocity event, if you want to call it. And uh, so it's a risk management. Uh, We're hitting that 66% Fibonacci level. We're hitting it, boys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a really good point though jason on the what is what is a tail event for different types of managers obviously for managers who are mostly the risk budget is mostly equity beta then the tail event is a major drop like a short-term drop in equity beta but for a tactical manager um or managers that vol size for example the big tail event for those managers has been the V-shaped recovery that we currently experienced, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, lots of strategies that use trend or, or vol sized had very, very little exposure come mid-March. That yep. second sort of 15% drawdown in stocks, trend followers didn't experience, risk mm -hmm. parity didn't experience, yep. but, um, you know, 60, 40 experienced, but now those, those um, strategies are positioned. They've got a very high bond position. They've got a low equity beta and you've got a V shaped recovery. So um, the tail in mid March for a lot of strategies was to the upside. So, right. you know, different strategies need to think about hedging different types of tail risks and those tail risks are highly conditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and look. To be fair, I when I when I speak to prospective clients and I tell them about the fact that we try to minimize tail by being diversified, both in asset allocation and strategies and so on, I do say like, you know, you might want if you're the type of guy that can handle X amount of loss, that tends to be you know directional in in nature, the, the equity markets losing money, then you might want to consider adding a tail protection strategy on top of this, and. And explain to them that they they're gonna probably lose a little bit of the benefit that they would get, the return that they would get from being just just focusing on diversification, taking your lumps, right? Like a lot of tactical managers took a hit, but they didn't take the last hit, right? But they also didn't recover from here. Uh, that last hit is it good? At, that's that's you explain that to a, to a I've explained that to clients, and they're like, oh yeah, I can take the first leg as long as the second and third leg doesn't happen. And that's yep. kind of what tactical managers have done for the most part, right? The problem is that we haven't seen a second or third leg happened for 10 years and yeah. and so it's a difficult pill to swallow but the choice is clear i would say 90 percent of them didn't take my advice of taking a table protection strategy um the other 90 percent just said like i want the long-term returns and i'm okay with taking that first hit that that insurance uh what did you call it not not the premium but the uh, the, deductible. the deductible yeah right so yeah listen, there's been a lot of a deductible. deductible payments and very little insurance payouts over the last 12 years yeah Exactly right. Yeah, there's I, been I a lot the, of deductibles being paid. The, the thoughtful practitioner would sort of understand the the bifurcation of of um, thought here, which is one is that there's an equity risk premium, and that's going to be manifest in the long term. And if you're in a taxable account, you you might want to take some of your money and just put it there and forget about it, and have a sleeve of that in your portfolio. And then you're going to want to have a, a sleeve of your portfolio that does these other things, and um, that that in various ways, you know, uh, covers off the ability to uh, adapt, the ability to be resilient. Um, you know, you know, it sort of covers off these other angles, and that that way you're you're kind of covered by both. You, you you've got some sort of you know low low cost factor exposure. Um, one of those factors, beta. One of those factors can be value can be, you know, a cap size, all, whatever, however you want to look at that. And you, you're just going to hold those for through um, these, these uh, outside, these power law events, understanding that that's, that's a feature, not a bug. And you're going to have another portion of the portfolio, call it whatever it is, half a quarter, two thirds, whatever, whatever your risk parameter is that adapts, that uses all the various potential ways that you might think about the, the tail protection 
but then it has to also rebalance so that between the two, there's actually an extra little bit of advantage that comes from that longer term. It won't, it doesn't quite manifest the way people think it does. I think that they probably think that that tailwind is probably bigger than it is. But, I, you know, I think a, a thoughtful practitioner at, at, you know, all levels of financial intermediary would, would want to think about it in, in that way from an, app, from an applicability perspective. I don't know what you guys' thoughts on that are. Yeah, I guess it's what are the what are the relative and absolute risks that the client is concerned about, right? Correct. Yeah. Are they so concerned about underperforming their local market, the global stock market, a 60-40? Yep. Um, are they concerned about absolute losses versus absolute gains? And mm -hmm. I think what we've learned, I mean, we have the benefit of having been advisors and asset managers. And I think one thing we've learned is that client preferences change through time. Right, um, the way that, or the the focal point of investor anxiety when markets are ripping is on underperformance. The focal point for investor anxiety when markets are dropping is on loss of wealth. So, you know, really, if you were to ask most clients, what do you want? Well, I want a, a strategy that outperforms on the upside and and uh, and doesn't take losses, right? <laughs> um, so that's that's the holy grail, right? And and if you don't deliver that as an asset manager or an advisor then you're disappointing, right? Whether they vocalize it or not, you're disappointing clients. And so much of the effort we have made from an educational standpoint is to try to, you know, highlight, shine a bright light on the fact that you can't suck and blow at the same time, right? Um, so and, and you have to, you have to you balance uh, it out the best. Explicitly recognize that, that, you know, someone in Houston, Texas may have a different set of preferences than someone in, you know, um, California. And, and yep. that's, that's a, that's something that ha that is a real consideration behaviorally, behaviorally in the, in the whole portfolio construction process. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. Well, we've been at it for uh, just over an hour now, guys. I think we covered a lot of aspects of this topic. Anything that we missed that you guys want to uh, touch upon? There's lots of directions we could go, but I, I think we're, we're better to cap it and, and, um, save it for next time. Well, we might we might think about bringing in a, a, a tail protection practitioner and see if he can defend himself. I'll be honest. There's side. nothing to defend. I mean, I don't. I, I'm not <laughs> sure where the bones of contention are. Right. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. There's room it may for have everybody. A place. Yeah. yeah. What's your what Amen. boogeyman are you trying to defend against? Amen. Yeah. It's, and it's how much are you willing to pay for protection? All right. Excellent. All right. Well, All right. you know, we'll end up having no. another two hour conversation after this, and then we'll be like, oh, <laughs> we're hanging up. We should have told you. Five o'clock. It's Friday. Yeah. There you go. Another yeah, two hours ago. I never left yeah. the bar. Guys, I have uh, hung up now. I've hung up. Let's <laughs> actually think, let's actually say what we feel. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, nice first session. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll try a few of these, uh, hopefully bring some people on board and um, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, give us some feedback if you if you did and uh, just keep it to yourself if you don't. All right. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks. See ya.